Welcome, everybody, to another edition of Coffee and Open Source, a place where we get to have great conversations with some really interesting people. And I'm really excited for my guest today because my guest is Matthias Carlson. Matthias, do you want to say hello? Introduce yourself? Hello. I'm Matthias. <laughs> so do you want to maybe give it a little intro about who you are? Or do, do people care? Or? That's it's a good it, question. It's a good question. If, right? people, if people care. I mean... <laughs> I'm uh, an occasional speaker, so I usually still, like speak about DevOps and .NET and uh, Azure and things like that. Uh, I'm uh, a, a user group organizer and I organize the local .NET user group. And I'm also a conference organizer, so I organize a couple of conferences here in Sweden. Uh, I maintain a healthy number of open source projects uh, and contribute to a few more and I, I consume many more. And so I've been around in open source for a while. I'm also uh, .NET Foundation member uh, as a person, as a project, or, and also on the board uh, of directors there. And also a business owner and employer, so I have that HR fund and things like that. But, but foremost, I'm uh, a father of two and a husband of one, and this is the puzzle I'm working today. Uh, so, yeah, it's that's who I am shortly. Well, I think that's very interesting because I see you as somebody who literally is just everywhere. Like whenever I whenever I'm on Twitter, like I'm all, you're always getting in there. You're throwing sort of great anecdotes out there about just what it is to be a maintainer in tech, somebody who's worked in tech their entire careers. So I mean, it's I'm really excited to chat with you. I think the first question that I would love to get from you is when did it all start? Like when did you come across tech, uh, and you were just like, this is my thing. Like, did you have like that very canonical like, uh, you know, you had the the computer at home and you got CDs in the mail. Like how, what's your origin story for tech? Well, I'm probably going to date me because my origin story is always before CDs existed. So I, I started on uh, like my first code I wrote probably was in the late eighties uh, on my brother's uh, Commodore 128. Uh, and then in the later, like 88, 89, I got my Amiga uh, 500 and that's where my true passion started for coding and things like that. And and the, the fun of like when I was young and where I lived, uh, tech wasn't a profession I think that anyone considered. Uh, it was uh, either you like worked in construction or you worked in the, in the industry or as my family has a line of electricians. So I started uh, like that career uh, and worked my way into like uh, I went to uh, live in the army and then I went back to school a bit and worked in operations in the late 90s. And that's where I first got to contact, uh, in touch with open source because the Amiga didn't succeed as my, that was my true passion platform, but well, it didn't go as it should have done with that one. So I started dabbling in with things like Novell Netware and Linux and well, Netware didn't go so well either. So I started with Linux. So that's what my, like, my initial uh, open source thing and we did a lot of servers and more on the operation side and went through the dot-com boom and switched to uh, went back to school and switched to development in like 2002 and there it went uh, first of all a lot of cgi scripts and things like that but uh, i jumped on the dotnet bandwagon early on uh, when i worked at a telecommunication company as a developer and been on dotnet since 2002 ish something like that so it's it's been many years with dotnet uh, but i mean i started not on the microsoft platform but it ended up there and now I'm back on the Linux platform and doing containers and stuff again. So it's uh, all that hard work in the beginning. Paid well, it's, it's, it's funny because like everything is very cyclical, right? Like you start like the whole, I always talk about with like the whole client versus server concept, right? Mm -hmm. Like we were so dependent on the server because clients were so cheap. And then it's like, well, now like we have all this access to all these powerful resources. So everybody should get VMs now. And now we're getting down to this path where it's like, but do we want that latency of going back and forth to the server and the client, right? Uh, and I think that's what's really, really interesting. Um, uh, and I think it's all interesting because, because <clears throat> when I started doing my first server-related coding, that was with the bullet bo bulletin board scene when you called each other with modems. So I, I was a member like 
on the coding seed of Amiga, uh, the Amiga scene has where we did uh, things like what could we push the hardware and we met up, uh, bring brought our computers and had user group meetups. But also like when we weren't, weren't in person, the, we dialed each other up to our, our built-in board systems. And sure. my first uh, like what I did a lot of coding there was actually doing small add-ins and like we call them doors that were small plugins to the built-in board systems and. That is very similar, actually, to what I'm doing with things with the serviceless. It's actually a console application. It's not like so. It's full circle. Sometimes we have gone with the whole like. There's so many magic descriptions for Kubernetes things or uh, .NET workers or what. It almost ends up like it's a console application. You have a main entry point. Yep. You write up some text and you exit. And so there's a lot of new really cool things and we can do it at scale but there's also some like there's we're standing on shoulder giants and some things has been the same since the 70s too uh, we have a lot of nicer languages and nicer frameworks and we can do things quicker and the tooling has improved so much more but but some things are just console applications still so i mean it's full circle in some ways you you can make the same argument for like web apps all just being forms over data right like yeah. I got some data and I want to have a website that sits on top of that data and allows me to do interactions with it, right? Um, which leads me to like a, a, a like my next question. Uh, I think, you know, most of the problems that developers are trying to solve are problems that have probably already been solved a million times. It's just my business has a particular use case that's a bit different than other businesses, right? But there are some developers, I think you, you can um, acknowledge yourself as being one of them, is like, you let, you're a bit meta and you like building like tools for developers, not products, right? Yeah. Like what was kind of one of your big interests in kind of like that developer productivity, the building of tools, the, you know, you mentioned shoulders of giants, right? Like being one of those shoulders that you, that other developers stand on. Yeah, but well, I think I always like to write, I've, I've been being into meta programming since well, since the early days, because sometimes, like, if something is can be automated, I really like to automate it because I don't want to do tedious. To like, there are people that like to do the same thing every day. Um, I like to, I rather rather do the recipe and automate things uh, to be able to tackle the next problem. But, I mean, so that's for why I like the tooling space in the way because that makes me. I can focus on the next business problem or the next uh, other like to actually solve something that I can do wrong. Um, and and I think I like the composability of tools because I can take one tool that has one specific purpose and combine it with another tool. And it's been the same even if you do things like microservices or something like if you do them uh, focused, then it's more easy to maintain, but also you can easier combine them to get uh, the final thing. So sometimes it can be that uh, what I like is there's so many great services now that we can start up quickly. Like it could be that, uh, like a meetup or there could be a service to get your own website quickly out. Uh, and then you have to evaluate like if you want that dependency, but you can at least get started and see if the idea works. And that's why I like with tools. Like before I do something really custom, that might be the end goal. Like I might write my son something really custom and slim, but you need to test that the idea works first. And there uh, it's good to have like an arsenal of tools or uh, try other tools or services. Yeah, I, I think um, it was this, did you, I guess your origin for that was you saw tools that you needed that needed to get built. And then yeah. over the course of time, you were just like, oh, I, I enjoy building tools for other tools. So I should just continue to build tools for tools. Yeah, and I mean, it's also like it's easy to if the tool's purpose is limited, it's easy to reuse yeah. it uh, sure. uh, and also to bring it on. So the, like uh, when I worked in the telecommunication industry, I did a lot of small tools to do things like move files or uh, things like that. So that's why like my ops turned into development because I can see my development skills could make my ops lives easier and then it's uh, I went like I like development more, but that's something like if for me to copy a bunch of files based on the date, it's better for me to do a tool for that than to do a script each time, or because that tool can I can bring forward to other clients, other projects, uh, and 
And for me, often open sourcing those tools has been, well, then it's, so, it's no brainer to share it between uh, projects and customers and clients or uh, friends or whatever, because it's there, it's a, a permissive license and like anyone, uh, there won't be a discussion uh, who owns it or whatever it's. Uh, so that's sometimes could be too good to do. Uh, often like start a project on your first yeah. time just to bootstrap it and then like you say like to your client well i have this ready part code do you want me to sp uh, and that's something like when people how can i make open source sustainable well for me often i've been like well i have this ready code yep. that i can I, if you just uh, like let me do a couple of hours of consulting i can evolve this project to do also fit your needs yeah uh, so that's been where I've been lucky to be able to consult and bring some some of the tools uh, out for uh, for everyone to use and like that. So I think that's something. But it's it's that's hard for not everyone, uh, and and that's the problem. Is not like about it's hard to sell open source, and that's a shame. I think I, I'm. It's unfortunate. It's uh, it, it's in, uh, you said a couple of things like that resonate with me like i talk about technology in general but specifically open source is about lego blocks right mm -hmm. like you know if anybody who has you know downloaded like used like npm like an npm package right like if you're a javascript developer you know what npm is it's like a, it's a package manager for node when you like when you just do like a, a new application it's downloading like seventeen thousand projects you've never heard of right and there's all this code that you don't know what's actually doing underneath the hood unless you go and look at the GitHub repositories for them. However, they're all Lego blocks that allow you to get what you want. Like you want to build a website or you want to have some sort of server application that interfaces with something. Like this is very, very important when we start thinking about, like I liked your comment about making open source sustainable. Like how do we amplify the voices of those projects that are used but aren't known they're being used yeah and, and the, the problem is like many of these lego pieces uh it could be the part that get attention could be someone that uses other lego pieces uh yeah. so it's sometimes like just this like if i'm doing uh, this image library or i'm doing this uh, build thing or whatever uh, that's it could be a part of a really successful other open source software, uh, but you get no benefit from that. And that, that's that's something that we need to find some way for, for the package man like NPM or NuGet or something to recognize. Uh, and because it's even more invisible with things like uh, the new, uh, for good or bad, the new C, like new, the new product format. Well, it's not new anymore, but when they shifted from the very verbose XML format in Visual Studio for, uh, to a more lighter one, uh, you will only see the first level of dependencies. Uh, in the old package config, you will at least see all dependencies. And and that's uh, something like you will only see the first package, but you won't see all the transient packages that those uh, are on. And then almost the same with Node, like the big config, if you see, if you look at the package lock uh, file for that NPM project, you will see, uh, you will see the gigs of the thousands of thousands of package, but often you will just yeah. see in, in your package config, you might only see one or two packages. Uh, and that's the whole like with sustainability, like how do we shine light on all those transient dependencies? Uh, because it can be, it could be a logging framework that many use that has an exploit and is first when they have an exploit they get their attention or it could be uh, like an uh, an like an encryptation library for how we transfer http uh, that suddenly get, and then you see like oh it's two people that maintain this that millions of people use um and so it's uh, and that is only bad press so it would be good if we can uh, find a conversation uh, before an incident happens because uh, it's uh, and also see like some real bad examples when uh, open source projects get offered VC money, but the VC has like they have no they have no idea of why this project exists, what it does, what drives the maintainers. Uh, like it's not a money problem often. Uh, it could be uh, for some, but often it's like you need to find out what motivates this project. Uh, and and for some it's money well, for many it isn't so it's it's really hard to just say it's a funding problem uh, it's it's so much more it's, sometimes it's a recognition problem uh, but also like it can be 
really sad when I see uh, some really good libraries and I I can like uh, like there's a big uh, there's an image library in .NET that many know and I know it's like I I was one that, that buy the most licenses and I have a small company of twenty employees and then you see like uh, why didn't like if it, like any big corporations buy a license <laughs> it's really weird so it's uh, there seems to be and that that sometimes like I think is an acquisition problem because it's yeah. so easy to to acquire open source software. Uh, and that's done by one department, but the building is done by a separate department. Now, I have been, I do a consulting with many like big, large enterprises, and uh, it's sometimes really hard to. It's two different people need to talk to when you when there's an invoice versus there's a developer dependency, and it's only when those two people meet is in commercial software. Uh, yeah. So like, how how do we get? Uh, because I for my, for myself, I think companies should have this discussion because there's a vulnerability in not having control over your supply chain. Like you're actually depending on one person for yeah. a really critical thing, part of your system. That's something you should think about and uh, and secure uh, in a good way. I mean, yeah. not only when there's an issue or, and that's why sometimes like the, the big, uh, there's only, there's like, if you even check the GitHub UI, we have issues, but there's no praise, which you almost have, <laughs> like the almost like we have issues and discussions, but there's no like, oh well, now we have sponsorship, but how can I just tell yeah. someone like, yeah, <laughs> like there's a lot that you said there that I would love to talk about, but I, I do want to make like the buy a beer thing. Like it's funny that you mention like there's no praise, and I think the the only way that you can really say like I like this repo is literally by starring it, right? Like, yeah. and that's like a very, I don't know. I, I, I have a bunch of repos starred that I probably haven't looked at in like five years just because I start it and I don't know where I go to unstar them in bulk. So I just <laughs> I just leave them, right? Uh, but you said something, you've said a, a couple of really interesting things, especially about funding open source, right? Like, especially in this world where you have large organizations or even small organizations Le leveraging open source so heavily to the effect that breaking changes that are decided by one or two people can impact the work of hundreds of developers in a particular organization, right? And, you know, I've had this conversation a few times and I'd love to get your thoughts. It's like, how do we fix that model? Because I don't think that model works at scale. Um, one, because people are profiting off of open source, which whether your opinions of that or not, it's not ethical. But secondly, there needs to be this backstream or upstream contribution back, right? And a lot of companies don't do that. Some companies do it very, very well, but most of them are very, very large companies that are invested in PR around open source, right? But there's a lot of companies that exist that just take NPM packages or NuGet packages and they just use them. What are your thoughts about how those size companies, how they can, I guess, I don't want to say be more ethical because that's not fair to the company, but how can they give back to open source? If you don't have the ability to fund, you don't have the ability to, you know, contribute upstream, like what, what can they do? Yeah, I, I think the problem is like, it's a diverse problem because there's, yeah. there's not one solution, but there are some, like, I think the main part is that they need to be aware of open source. And I think that's one thing like many aren't even aware of what dependencies they have or what license they, they, and, and that's, I mean, that's something I think companies need to do their due diligence uh, to see who do we depend on? Uh, what do we do? Like a real is boring, but almost like a threat, like the old uh, SWOT analyst, like what are our weaknesses, our strengths? Uh, how do we do, what do we do if this doesn't work anymore? Because then you will see like, oh shit, we depend on this, which is our just two guys. Should we fund them? Should we help them? Or like, yeah. But also I think we need to make the acquiring process easier because there's, the problem is like it or not, there are things like, it's really easy to add stuff to my Azure or Google bill or things that because that's all I already have agreement with Google or Microsoft or Amazon. Uh, so it would be nice sometimes if it was possible to almost uh, not a tax, but almost see in in my pipeline, see who do I depend on 
and distribute parts on that bill. Because uh, adding a couple of dollars to a many thousand dollar Azure bill probably wouldn't, would almost go unnoticed, but it wouldn't go unnoticed for those maintainers that got something back. Very true. Uh, uh, and th there's also things like we need to uh, sponsorship is a problem because that's almost like you end up in uh, in the whole well is this a non-profit thing or the whole giving things or uh, they should be thankful for these gifts or whatever and and there's also a, a culture thing because it's very different in different countries how how they work with non-profits or how they sponsor things or what they're legally able to do uh, because in some countries you can't just send money abroad because that's uh, like it could be money laundering or it could be it's hard tax wise or things like that. Uh, whereas in the US, it could be almost like a tax write off just to send money somewhere. Yes. Uh, so it's it's very different. Like uh, so th there's that's the complicated part because open source has no borders. Uh, the, you can have consumers from any country anywhere and and that's often been a problem when you see this thing like in the beginning we get up a sponsorship it was, was only stripe and that wasn't available in all countries so it couldn't be paid out to all countries and how do you do how do we find something that works uh, and and that's like sometimes it could be boring us but we have a lot of software vendors today uh, microsoft we have amazon we have google we have the tech data so whatever of the world uh, could we find a way to find open source in into those venues so they actually was part of the bill sorry the word the word tech taters is very funny to me um mm. but I, I i like you make a very valid point and, and again i think some companies do it very well yeah some in a lot of, but but there are a lot of other companies that they just see open source as a as a commodity which it is right I mean, the fact that you can literally do a, a, an internet search, a Google search or Bing search or Yahoo search or whatever, like you can search for like NPM package this or NuGet package this, and you might have like seven or eight different implementations of the same functionality. Like, and that can be very challenging for a user because you have to navigate, okay, which is the one that I actually want to take? And, to, and you know, you look at, okay, how uh, frequent is this committer? Like, what does the community look like? Does it work with the interface that I'm more familiar with? But at the end of the day, they're still dependent on those people. But they yeah. treat it as a commodity. It's like buying milk. Like you don't care about the cow the milk came from, right? Yeah, but it's also interesting as a maintainer because once you get money, there's also expectations. And that's yes. maybe not what you sign yeah. up for. Uh, for. For like sometimes it's easier to offer consulting or do things like I will do this for... 40, like I will give you 10 hours of support or whatever. But if you get funding, like it's very, very different if you're like gonna offer a support contract because then oh, how will I do this or what's expectations or uh, what if the customer wants to take the project in a different way that I want? Uh, because you don't want to lose like your autonomy of your project. You want it to take it in your direction. But if there's money involved, there's expectations. And I mean, for some projects, for me, it was like I strap an MIT license and just throw it because it's done and it's there. Uh, it's not that it needs more maintaining or I, I don't want any more expectations or anything like that. And I know some use the unlicensed because they like people can steal it, but there will be nothing more of it. So it's it's hard to have one problem. But I think, but we need to have things like I think NPM and NuGet can play a big part there because there is where people meet it and there's where yeah. they acquire the software and also like with github but i mean yeah there's so many people especially i mean it's in the test space that then they don't have a github account they don't end up they just they they just uh, add package in visual studio and they search for something and they add it uh with no second thought and there would be nice if something can surface up in in either the ci tools or uh, just like you do uh, an audit of things that could be these are the product you depend on uh, and they accept funding or whatever so that could be clear almost like you can do a report to their management or something uh, yeah I, something. There, there's definitely something to that i wonder if it is as simple as and this is what this is what the hard part is right because if a company said like oh like i work at large company and we use this like that's a company privacy issue for whatever reason, right? 
But I wonder if it's as simple as like this is this is something that we're okay with taking on. And I think one of the things you said that was really interesting is some, like you said it a few a few minutes ago. Some maintainers don't want anything to do with that because maybe they live in a country where that sort of thing isn't supported. Maybe they're just doing it for the fun. Maybe they don't want influence. And it becomes really, really challenging, especially like if you get bombarded with issues from people who obviously work at some company uh, and they're saying they're basically requesting features or requesting fixes or requesting things. And then it immediately becomes, okay, well, who owns this IP? Is it me as the open source developer or is it you as the consumer who's making money off of something else that uses my my tool? Yeah. I mean, and I'm like, as a maintainer, like you're often interested in like how much effort someone can put into an issue and yeah. how much little effort they can put in a PR. Uh, it, <laughs> yeah. it, it's, 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 it's like, I even had people that almost had the patches in the issue and like, if you have the patches for the thing you yeah. want to fix, why not just open a PR? Yeah. It's 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 interesting how much like how the barrier for some people like they have no barriers to complain, sure. yeah. but they have like a oh. giant barrier to contribute. Yeah, I've talked about this a lot. There's definitely a threshold, right, yeah. between issues and PRs. Issues is just feedback, right? Like it, the the name issues, in my opinion, isn't really great. It's just feedback. It's yeah, negative feedback. Yeah, negative <laughs> feedback, positive feedback, whatever. But that that I guess that wall between providing feedback and providing actual contribution in the effect of code or docs, like all of it is fee- all of it is contribute contribution, right? Good, bad, yeah. or indifferent issues is is contribution as well. But for whatever people think about that, but I think the PR thing is I'm making as a as a PR creator, I'm making a a tactical decision to basically put my recommendations up for scrutiny across people, right? So like if I'm if I don't think I'm that great of a developer and I commit a PR and you as a maintainer is like, "Oh, this is a this is a bunk PR." I'll maybe I'll work with, if I'm a nice guy, I'll work with you to make it not trash or not or maybe more what I'm looking for. But a lot of maintainers will just say, "Nope, this PR doesn't fit our co- our coding contributions" and then just close the PR. Right? Mm-hmm. And that's yeah, that's at the right of the maintainer, but like there's it's very challenging for somebody coming in to want to contribute when there's that fear of like, oh, maybe this person will just close it without even acknowledging it because I don't accommodate like what their idea is of a PR. Yeah, and that, that's why I think you should always start small. And so your so your your investment in, in the PR is the lower possible. So start with a typo. Because that, or something like a documentation thing, or something yeah. that isn't too big, uh, because then you'll see like how will they handle. So you learn the process for that project, uh, yeah. because if they are really helpful, uh, and like if they ignore you, like and and this is almost a bigger problem with bigger projects, because I have like projects that are maintained by very big corporations that don't answer PRs at all. Yeah, they 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 and. And that's like then you should almost close that feature because if you won't be like then it's not it's not open source it's source open, uh, it's something different and yeah. Uh, but also like it's almost like it's not you have to see both sides of it because you can't just place oh here's a thousand lines of code on a maintainer because then they, they like you're putting you're putting work on the maintainer so it's it's twofold it's you need to to be respectful on both sides and that's why I think it's good to. Have a, a, like a low investments, so you will learn like the process with that project and things like that, and then you can start with something bigger and work up. Uh, don't start refactoring anything or renaming or just uh, doing uh, things like that because start small and see the process and how do they want the issues named or do they need because many like well we want our issues first because we use that for for our release notes and because we're a responsible project and, and then like oh okay then you need some why uh, but if you put a lot of effort and that it's not in the direction of the project well it will be closed and it's not no disrespect to you or yeah. um so it's Often I find the problem because the the the, the commodity that is the biggest pro- like lack of is time. Uh, yes. We have uh, and that's that's why you need to be respectful of our like both 
the like our users or maintainers and uh, those community we need to be respectful of people's time uh, it's the whole thing like you don't write just write hello in a in a message uh, you, you're I'm guilty like, i'm you, very guilty of that myself but i usually say hello and then some stuff <laughs> afterwards but i like to do hello first yeah uh there's something interesting too that you said uh like this idea of you know starting small i'm a huge proponent of like if you like Developers come in all walks of life and some developers don't feel comfortable like contributing to the Linux kernel, right? Yeah. But like there's definitely areas like every developer will say like the thing that I care probably the least amount is like testing and docs, right? So like if you can come in and you want to contribute, like read the docs to make sure the docs make sense from a onboarding perspective. Look at the unit test to make sure you have code coverage. Like these are things that every developer will just take a contribution almost immediately. As long as you're following their standards, like I, I, I can't speak for every developer out there, but not very many developers are going to say, oh, it looks like all this is just a bunch of unit tests. Like I don't want any of these unit tests. Like it's, I mean, at least me, I would, I would very much be like, give me all of you. Do you want to do more unit tests? Do you want me to yeah. make you like a co-maintainer of this? If you just keep writing unit tests for all the code that I'm writing? Like, I think there's value in, you said, starting and then, small and building a relationship with the maintainer. Yeah. And that, like, because I think also if you're respectful and you build trust, because a lot of open source is based on trust. Sure. Because, because many, like, these projects where I have co-maintainers are never met in person, uh, yeah. which is, like, uh, when it's really cool when you're like, oh, we're 20 people in the 12 time zones, and most of the people like you barely you know, didn't you don't even know their real name almost there's a handle and a cute avatar or something yeah. like but that's but still you have you have built trust because you've done things over time and that's i think sometimes people are uh they think things build like in open source sometimes like a week isn't long in open source no. uh no. But, but like well i have my bug now well if you don't pay me now, I will get to it when I get to it. And yeah. and also like just like before we had this chat today, I had to get my son to sleep. We had to arrange for the homework and things. Uh, there's dinner and also a day job and other commitments. And you need to be respectful that many like this might be one of many projects the maintainer has. Well, it could be that there's other things in their life at the moment. It could be that they're like, oh, they're now studying for a driver's license or whatever. And that's, uh, I think we need to be better communicators or more respectful or uh, uh, more clear. And I mean, I'm being sometimes guilty of uh, creating those big PRs. Uh, but then I always try to write, I know this is a big PR. You, yeah. I'm fine with you closing it. There's no yeah. hard feelings, just to be clear. But uh, this is my reasoning. I, I know I did that for a tool that hadn't been maintained for a while, so I tried to bring it up to the latest .NET and uh, uh, yeah. upgrade it like, for vulnerabilities. And that will be, uh, if something is on .NET Core 1 and you bring it up to .NET 6, there's been changes in yeah. both product systems and runtimes and uh, what's possible. And so that could be a big PR, but that could also be like something that if he chooses to accept that PR, it could be something that revalid like brings new life into that project. Uh, it's and it was almost like that um, a couple of years ago. I took over the maintainership of a, a JSON serializer, and that bring, brought new life. That because I brought the like .NET uh, Core three one and one oh and that standard and things like that to it. So it could I mean sometimes it could be, but you still need to be clear in your expectations. And I think yeah. many aren't clear in their expectations when they open a PR. Uh, some are like, I'm fine if you close it, no problem. Uh, but you you need to be very clear with people you've never met and never spoken to. Uh, so, you know, like, I have, I don't want to place a burden on you. And that's something I like, because I'm maintaining myself. I know it could be, it's not, it's not always a gift when you get yeah. fr free code. It's something that I need to, even if, when you're a hundred miles away and doing something else, I still have to maintain this piece of code you gave me a couple of years ago or whatever. So yeah. it, it could be, uh, and it, like it's hard sometimes to, uh, like, you can have bad days and you can be blunt or whatever. But sure. it can also be like yeah. if you if, if you get the, uh, 
it's not easy to see context always. Like if you get the, like, uh, it's better. It was better this year, but I don't know. Hacktoberfest was like this. Like when you get oh, I get all these free PRs. Well, I got twenty PRs that fix one letter. Yeah. Uh, I'm a bit tired now. Uh, <laughs> so it's it could be that kind of thing also. Like it's it, you, you need start small, but it still needs to add value to the product. <laughs> yeah, I think also too like. You can be very transparent, I think, with people that want to contribute. You can say, well, I welcome your PR. Like if somebody come is, comes out of nowhere, they're like, I want this feature. And I have no problem. And I'm like, well, okay, I welcome your PR, but I also reserve the right to close it if yeah. I don't know what's going on. Because I very much subscribe to the, like, you're a ghost. Like random GitHub contributor who opens a PR, like you're a ghost. Like when you disappear in like a year or six months or whatever it is after you PR and then some person finds an issue with code you wrote, unless the code is very clear, I'm lost. Yeah. And then I'm stuck having to figure out, like re-engineer your code to figure out what is going on. Um, and that's problematic for a lot. And that's what I think that's one of the key pieces to like burnout in open source. There's like, at least yeah. how I see it, there's two like key areas. One, just the flood of potential negative feedback. That's very draining on a person. But also having to manage that experience of other people's code, maintaining other people's code when that person is no longer around to help. Those, are, at least, that's how I see like the one, some two of the big causes for you know open source burnout. And you know how can we do better? Like I think one of the ways that we can do better is just being okay with n having your code or having your contribution. Like, it needs to be readable by the person that you're submitting the PR to. If you're using some crazy algorithms or you're doing some some weird thing or you're bringing a new NuGet package that doesn't that has no context, like that's risk for a maintainer, yeah. right? And I also think like it's sometimes the problem is like when you start a product, you're just uh, for better like word happy for the attention. So the first PRs you yeah. will almost merge uh, quickly and. Then you come to this hour like you need to maintain it and then and that's why I think it should be uh, you need to uh, have some like hard thinking yourself as a maintainer like how do I want this to long term be sustainable like uh, should I uh, split to a core set of functionalities and a contribution part that this is uh, where I can have a playground and bring in stuff for contribution yeah. uh, and this is the core part and and I know we've done this for a couple of projects I maintain where they grew so much when so we like we split it between two organizations one for this is things that the core team doesn't maintain, but it's there. And this is what the core team maintains and supports. And this is here. So it's a clear distinction. But it's like you still want to value the community contributions and have given a place that uh, get, gets exposure and is uh, public available. Uh, so, but also the good things like a succession plan like what happens if I'm hit by a bus? Uh, and, uh, and because I'm. I'm uh, I was supporting in one project where one uh, one of the like the lead maintainer uh, passed away uh, yeah. unplanned. Uh, this uh, and and that was hard because the problem is like well legally he owns the IP of that code, he owns the GitHub account, he owns the new Git account, he owns uh, the npm account or whatever. Uh, and then you if you don't have a succession plan ready, written down how how who do you want to, then you have to talk to the state and talking to someone's. Uh, like uh, husband or why, uh, like wife or whatever about uh, some GitHub project, they yeah. probably don't care about them when they're doing funeral yeah. arrangements. Uh, so that's good to have a, like a conversation before. Like, uh, like oh, well, if I have to be, I want uh, like I want Gary to do, take care of this project, or because if you so that could be a responsible thing to do too. Like, what happens if uh, to give someone more the keys? And that's I think it's important to uh, like have a an organization on NuGet and an organization on uh, GitHub where more than one person can be uh, uh, have, have the keys if something should happen um, and things like that. Uh, I think that's some discussions we need to have more also like how can we be responsible as maintainers but also just to even the burden because it's not good to be uh, solo on something that uh, gains traction because it's it can be very lonely and very like burnout you say if if you if you're a sole maintainer of something that has a million downloads uh, suddenly 
uh, there will be a lot of expectations and you need to find somewhere to vent <laughs> because uh, you, Twitter is a place, but it's not a good place to vent <laughs> too much. I mean, it's a great place to vent if you also want to be a part of the problem, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I think I might mention this a few months ago on Twitter. Like, I I just started just creating drafts and draft. I was very upset about something, and I was just creating drafts and drafts, and I would just delete the drafts and then delete the yeah. drafts. But it's, it was very cathartic for me because I was getting my my point out there. But if my point isn't valuable. Like all of it's going to do is just stir up drama or it's going to offend someone or if it's going to just be a negative experience for someone like it's not valuable. So but I needed to get it out because I felt like I needed to get it out. And I was being very, very trying to be very political about everything and being very yeah. just calm. Um, and I think in general, like. I don't want to spend my time on the Internet, like being bummed out. So like, what can we do to like avoid areas? Like I'm very, I'm a very huge advocate of like blocking people or uh, muting people because I'm like, I got enough drama in my life. I don't need to deal with like random tech drama about something that doesn't even really um, give me what I'm looking for. So I think the like, and that's, that's part of open source as well is like this whole social community of like people who just are developers who are vocal about being developers, right? Yeah, and, and that's why I think it's really healthy for projects to also have a private space where the, like, everything can't be done in open sometimes because some things need to be, you need just, just to vent, even if, because some, uh, some feelings are in the moment or uh, passion in the moment. And then it's really, and that's why I've, I've been fortunate to uh, be on the product where we have, like, current projects where we have a couple of maintainers. Uh, so we can, we can have a private Slack or a private Discord where we can, just like before you go ranting or doing every emotion on Twitter, because the problem with when you get something out, it will get retweeted and it will resurface. So it can be, it can have a long tail before it's gone or something is never gone or sometimes it ruins people's lives even like it. So it's, it's good to find, even if it's a comp like, it, it, sometimes you don't need to bring other maintainers onto your, but I think it's good to have other maintainers to talk to, uh, to have like a safe place or discuss or uh, learn from each other. Like, how do you have, like, just ask question, like, how do you handle if someone asks you? Because like, uh, if you've been in open source long enough, like I have received threats, uh, I have received phone calls to my work uh, environment and people that are go very long way. I'm like, how can they be, it, for me, it's so like, how do they find the time? Because I, I, I have no time, so I, I don't know how they find time to do things. Uh, but I mean, it's, but also it's, I mean, you don't know how much damage you do if you send, if you dock someone or you send some yeah. package or send threats to them. Uh, that has a really long tail. Uh, that person will yeah. lose trust a long time. And I mean, that's where, so I mean, but I mean, also like, it's so easy to, the problem me, I'm, I'm so solution oriented, so I just want to fix everyone's problem. And that can also be tired. So I'm like, I, I like try to be really nice to an issue. And if you do this, and the problem sometimes I noticed with, with issues, like you get a lot of <clears throat> a lot of verbal communication or communication as long as there's a problem. And but once the problem is solved, they're gone. Yeah. And that's almost the same on Stack Overflow sometimes. Like you can go to all this effort to answer someone's question and the, I didn't solve it. And they really back and forth until the problem is solved and then they're gone. And like, that's like at least Marcus has answered or say thank you or whatever. And that's that's something else it's, I think is interesting. And like, and the problem with open source sometimes like you, you need to build trust over time because you don't know how long people will be interested in your library because once your library does what they think, it will go, they, it, it will just be, they will take it for granted. Uh, it's when it, uh, and that's like the, uh, that's why like you, you will need to know that maintainers won't trust you out of the door. They will trust you when you have shown commitment for X number of weeks or months or years. Yeah. It's, it's very true. Like, and you mentioned something that I thought like, but the long tail of things. I'm always surprised in how quickly things disappear or oh, and i'm also in so interested in how some things tend to linger like like a lot of new like i think we live in this 24-hour news cycle where like we need news like constantly 
or we just move on to the next thing. But sometimes some news sticks around, and I'm always curious as to why that particular piece of news sticks around versus, you know, something that might, in my opinion, might be a bit more important. Um, maybe it's just there's a, you know, a couple of people that are amplifying that news a bit in a bit more different way. I think, I guess my biggest thing is like, why does some stuff live longer than others? Especially like negative stuff tends to live way longer than positive stuff. Yeah. And, and I mean, and sometimes I think we need to appreciate the people that do it for a long run more because I mean, you should appreciate a product where someone, there's some people that are really good at starting projects uh, and they get all this success. And, but then there's like, well, this has product has actually been maintained for a decade or, and they have a few commits, it's months, it's nothing more or, but they still, they have, and there's, I think that's something also to be like, if you want to take the dependency, something that has, has been stable for a very long time should also be appreciated. There's so much like this new cool thing that someone tweeted about, uh, and this is uh, whatever, or uh, this was the yesterday's uh, web framework or whatever. Uh, it's sometimes like, we should also like appreciate what things like jQuery or whatever did because they, they were stable for a long time and they did offer a thing for a long time. Uh, and I mean, even if like I, I like shiny new things, uh, but sometimes it could be good to recognize like, well, these maintainers have been when you evaluate what product you should use or whatever, like these have been and, and that's hard to how do we visualize that or give credit to that, that this is um, uh, because sometimes I don't notice like for from like some products where that have done that are moderately successful uh some people what do you do well i just showed up uh, yeah. i showed up const constantly for a couple of years now like this has been since 2014 this was like in 2007 this was and uh, just like it's not been that we have this marathon each day but it's been that we show up each month and we do something and we have a continuous and i think uh, that's sometimes like uh, hard for people to uh, and it's so something like they always sometimes blame a vendor or something. But, but I've been at conferences where uh, people have like of uh, not competing, but other product has said like you shouldn't use that. It's Yagni. You will never need it. But I mean, why why focus on the negative? Like we can, I think so much we can also learn from each other as open source projects because men even if we have competing projects we will still have common ground with well things like sustainability or ci systems or uh, how do you do this with the sila a bot or whatever uh, like yeah. these things that we can still like cooperate with and uh, help each other and make our uh, like our maintainership easier uh, so uh, 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 some is and that's and some people are really sometimes uh, they're almost like, uh, well, they get hung up because they don't know what motivates this person to show up. Uh, th like they, they sometimes don't get why a product exists or why. Well, I mean, many open source projects I just did for me. It scratched my itch. That was the only intention for it to solve, and that's the like the leading has been the, like the shining light for to solve it. Like I have a problem, and I solve my problem, uh, and. Sometimes I've been lucky that it solves many people's problems, and that's it takes off. But that could be the only, yeah, the only motivator. And then it's like then funding won't help because that's not the driving factor of that project. Uh, what would help if you gave me more time somehow, or if you helped me with services? And that can be something else. Like for some some open source projects, it could be like, well, if you paid for uh, arranging events or uh, document writing, or that could be a better use of money for an enterprise to give you, uh, like. Instead of like complaining that uh, your design sucks, well, give them a new design. Ask yeah. the web of like this open source project. Like, I have great web designer. Would you like some help with that? Yeah. And that could be a, a better contribution because that will give the maintainer time, uh, so they can like spend more more time with a newborn or the dog or whatever. Yeah, but you're missing one key point, is that that's additional work, right? <laughs> like, and I think that's what the the real it's it's substantially easier, and this is just. Unfortunately, the way things work, it's way easier to just do a drive-by slam on somebody than want to be a part of the solution. There's some people that they, like I see, you're, I think you are one of them, that I see you everywhere and you're trying to help, right? But there's a lot of people not like that. They just, they want to open up an issue and if the person, if the maintainer says no thanks, there's just expletives, 
right? Or not expletives because GitHub does a pretty good job of filtering that stuff out. But I think it, at the end of the day, you know, you mentioned about staying on the shores of giants uh, at the beginning of this chat. And, you know, it's all, it's not just about stand, like focusing on the value that previous people have brought, but creating new value to bring in new people. Right, like this idea of outreach is very, very important. Like, there. Last time I checked, there's not a shortage of developer jobs out there. <laughs> there are too many developer jobs and not enough developers. And my yeah. my thought is like, okay, well, how can we get people into being technologists if the communities are very dependent? Are not dependent? That's not fair. Are very um, at times uh, not positive. Right? How can we do that? Yeah. And I mean, one thing, the problem was like, we need to, like, there's, we need a diverse set of things to make, improve things. Uh, what, what I really like is there's a lot more now with uh, other types of education, where there's boot camps or this, uh, like, where they do uh, like two shorter educations, because then you could get someone that, had uh, like well they were a baker before or they yeah. were working with cars or and because that's really valuable to get diversity just not the like you i want people of all colors or all genders or, but also all situations lives because that will improve your product or that will improve your product if you can get someone that has had another perspective regardless of the perspective that will improve uh of all and and also like it's that's why it's so good to get newbies to your product because they will get uh, the fresh view that yes. most of the people in your product haven't had. Uh, that's why they, like I learn so much from new hires because they yeah. have a, like they have no like they haven't like, they don't go in the, the old wheel of like I was supposed to walk this way, but they also ask questions or like why is this this way and yeah. and like that's such like. It could be totally right. We, and sometimes there's good reasons. And it's good to sometimes repeat those reasons because sometimes you'll forget why you did something. <laughs> yeah. So it's good. So it could be good to just read, oh, well, I, now I remember that old pain. That was why we did this way. Or, But it could be that, oh, that, this doesn't exist anymore because that kind of thing, well, that SDK isn't there anymore. Or that uh, stumbling block is solved now. So, uh, I mean, and, and so, but you need also to, like, there's so many like when you're like an open source product or like when you have your own business you will always get like uh, things like internship uh, sure. applicants and things like that and you need to value like i have one that had like a hundred companies in a two field uh, to the email and like uh, you're not valuing my time at no. least have one like at, at least put the effort in to do one email to each person you want to uh, have an internship with uh, and and it almost said like I, my twitter dms are open and i i get a lot of shitty dms but i also get some good and the good ones i always try to i i, I had one really good experience like uh, well this september when a, a student from brazil dm me and he was like i'm new with unity and i like i haven't done much Unity, so like i it ended up with me pair program to 3m with him the person i met but he was so nice and it was really like how do and sometimes if you're just kind and you're asking in a good way Often people will help you, and I will see. Yeah. I think it's the same with uh, if you open a PR. If like, if if you just like, be and something like, well, if you're afraid of getting like anonymous uh, GitHub account down with no picture or whatever, if you're sure. afraid of that kind of thing. But I mean, if you are just like uh, kind in your like, I'm trying to solve this. Is the right way? Like, uh, many people will. Uh, and if they are not, well, then those people aren't worthy of your attention and you can go yes. on. Uh, but if they are, like, if you're kind and they're kind back, then you will, it will be so rewarding and you will take it to your next level uh, with things. Like if you're a, a new developer, you will learn so much from, uh, and that's like open source is, is a super great playground to evolve your, because often it could be that your own will only do an MVC application at work and that will, all, you will maintain that until you die at work. That's the one. Yeah. But then you can do like in open source, you can like, I can play with CI systems. I can do some UI thing. I can play with the latest blazer bits because there's some uh, there, or I can do TypeScript or whatever, or Python machine learning. There's a whole, like a buffet of things you can play around with with an open source. And I think that's something that could be, uh, like it could also take you to the next career step because you will have 
evidence of things you've done. And that's something I often tell because I have like interns and students that we have a company and like the good thing about having uh, an open source is that you will have a portfolio you can show without yes. uh, uh, for your employer and, and not to like uh, check out my profile more like you can see I have worked with these technologies so yes. because there's so many that are bad at interviews where well even if you studied do like this write down do a, like a diary of what you've done in school so you can tell that into you even if you don't have work experience talk about what you've done I work with uh, this cloud thing or I work with the CI system or at least you can say uh, you know about it and because so often many people they know more than they give themselves credit for, especially in the beginning. Uh, and some people, especially uh, some older like us, we think we know more than we do. Uh, so it's <laughs> it goes both ways. Yeah. But I think that's um, so. I think that's a good thing. Like that's uh, to uh, that's why like I think it's possible. Like this can be so much very reward like very rewarding in, in open source too. And if people just get better communicating or ask nicely or didn't be competitive uh, when I don't need to. Uh, I think we can achieve so much, um, but also be patient because you need to recognize that people off, even if being corporations, some projects aren't the day job, even if sure. it's uh, under an umbrella. Uh, so they giving you time is a really big gift you should be like appreciative of. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned a couple of things that I think are just brilliant. I think one thing that I took from all of that is that the other thing you're talking about, about being kind and, and being willing to help and being open to different opinions, like these are things that transcend tech, right? Like I, yeah, I, yeah. there's very yeah. few tech problems. Most people are people problems. No. They're like, they're, oh, they're, yeah. there's people problems. And especially like, and, and it's so interesting when, uh, I especially le lately have been some like it's been some things and 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 then we like when you go one on one with people, it's a totally different story. Yes. When you like when you like okay, bring on. What's the problem? Okay. So you know, say if we solve this, if we won't be problem. Okay. Then we have a solution. But there's some like they need to get that out first, uh, or when they see like well I have good intentions. Or if you can the problem like with Twitter like you can't provide context. But if you have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, you can provide context like our reason like and like listen to people. And that's and that's why I like something really good because I like uh, I can talk a bit a lot and talk about and that's why podcasts are good for me because then I can just listen and take in uh, because for many other like uh, cultures or languages or whatever and then to get a different point of view. Uh, I mean, often I have had really heated Twitter discussions and then take it uh, like over to DMs and just do a Teams call or a Zoom call or whatever. And that's like, we're friends. This is no problem. But it's, it's something like, but if you have no context, it's yeah. almost like a shouting game. And I think uh, we need sometimes to find ways to escalate things to some other medium. So before they go too far or whatever. Uh, I think we're also all guilty of trying to just, like you mentioned way at the beginning, like we're all very guilty of just trying to like get noticed. Yeah. Like, and I think Twitter is probably one of the biggest um, villains in that story because you only have like, you know, two, two, like 140 or whatever it is, 280 characters, like to get your point across. So like, you have to be very blunt. You have to be very clickbaity. You have to like, you have like, Otherwise, what you're trying to get, like, it's just going to disappear in someone's timeline. So, like, the hotter the take, the more likely you are to get noticed. And that could be a very, like, you mentioned lacking context. Like, mm. the amount of times that I've seen a tweet by friends of mine that I, I literally see a tweet, and I'm like, oh, that's a, a, a terrible thing to say on Twitter without it because without any context, right? And you have a conversation with that person about it and they're like, oh, like this is the thing I was dealing with right now and I just wanted to just say something. And it's like, okay, that's great. But then literally like every single person that you interact with on Twitter is like, oh, what's going on with that person? Like that makes no sense. That's out of context. And they're just kind of not being a, a great person. Or, oh, they're shamelessly self-promoting something, which I'm totally fine with. But like it's it's very, very high hard to hide your... your um, your intention with Twitter because yeah. it's all very, very intentional. I mean, uh, but I even see sometimes like sometimes it's good to be external. Something like, like when you get the bird side of a conversation, it's like, see, 
these two people are actually in agreement. They just don't know it. So yeah. they're actually trying to prove the same point. And you see, they, they go, go on back and forth in the big thread. Uh, and that's interesting. And, I mean, but it's also so easy to finally write something like, because often when you write these really passionate tweets, it's based on a hundred other tweets that trigger yes. you. Yes. Yes, uh, and that, and that's the context. Like it could be that some uh, unfortunate soul just got that uh, that rant uh, on yeah. them because there's been other things or DMs or uh, the dog b bite you on the bone or whatever. Like you, it could be all things like, and that's the thing when you're anonymous or whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's really hard. But I mean, but also like, it's not only like I had so much benefit on Twitter. I met like. I have hired from Twitter. I've met people on Twitter that like, especially on conference things. Like I always tweet, like I got stickers, find me. I will or think yeah. of that. So it's, it's been like a huge driver of so much positive too. Uh, and, but I think sometimes it's, you just need to be aware. It's like, uh, there's some like great tools to measure, like how is the, how diverse are you following? Uh, there's some that can do that. And if you get the numbers and like, oh, I will only follow like not uh, 9% white men, well, then you will have an echo chamber. So try to do consciously follow more people or, yeah. and that's what like, so I follow more people than follow me just to get, I don't want to be an echo chamber. I want to be challenged. I want to get new points of view or whatever. Uh, but also like if someone doesn't, like if I see that someone's only draining, well, I might not follow you. Uh, and it's not impersonal. It's just not that you don't add value to the noise I'm receiving all day or whatever. Uh, so I think that's, uh, I think more like you show us maybe to, uh, and I think like, get consensus or whatever, like even if we don't agree, I think we should be able to say, let's agree to disagree more. Sure. Uh, it's, it's so often like we get polarized or whatever and things. And I mean, because uh, I can see, especially like, it could be like, well, some are sitting on a, like you're on the other side of the pond and I'm in Europe and we have all this kind of like, there's things from healthcare, where, but we should still be able to talk about it. Because yeah. we can take impressions of there's I can see that well, the cancer care is in the US is awesome, but if you get a nail in your finger, you will die. Uh, it's, uh, it's so it's different kind of like, but it could be other things like where uh, there's positive things, and we're going to learn and go forward. So I think you still at least it's good to listen to a, like taking impressions from a lot of like, more people and even if the, the competition or whatever. Uh, but I think it's so many echo chambers on Twitter and that's the problem. Uh, it's it's like when yeah. I see like, I saw some node developer, like I never seen the .NET project. Well, you only follow node developers. So it could be that you, that's why you never see .NET project. And the same with like .NET project. I've never seen a Java project. Well, if you only follow .NET developers, the likelihood is when someone jumps, rage quits .NET, then you will, might have one people person you follow that do Scala or something. Uh, yeah. But but it's oh, still well. an echo sham. <laughs> oh well, I mean, it, it's it's very funny. Like I I totally agree about the echo chamber thing. I've been trying very hard to get out of my own echo chamber because like I noticed like everybody knows what I do. Like everybody knows like where my areas of interest are, and I am around everybody that has the same opinions as me. So I've been trying very, very like trying to understand like how other people think, like not just in tech but in general. Because I'm generally curious, because I know that as, as many times as I've had a negative thought about people who don't think the same way as me, I know that people who don't think the same way as me have negative thoughts about me, right? Because that's just how life is. And I think one of the ways that we can do better is just be more empathetic to everybody. That goes back to your statement about being kind to people, being uh, willing to help people if they're kind to you back. Like, this is how we make the world a better place, not just tech a better place, but how we make the world a better place. And I think, you know, that's kind of a great way to end uh, this chat. And I wanted to thank you, Matthias, for hopping on and, and chatting with me about it. Uh, I, thank you. It was yeah. fun chatting you, Alan. I mean, yeah. I, I, think yeah. I, just, like, I think we need, at least we can't always help people, but can, we can acknowledge them. The, and I think that's the... Yes. Thing. Yeah. You know, it's, it's that level of like the I, I hear you, the I see you, right? And I think that's very, very important. When we when we end this conversation, I love to ask my guests, you know, a canonical, you know, when you think about tech and open source and the community that exists from it, like what's the first word that comes to mind? 
I would like to say it's commun- communication. No, it's yeah. been, uh, it's uh, for me, uh, I think that's why I think more should join because it's, you will learn so much more than technology. Yes. Uh, uh, especially if you're a junior, like you will, you will learn product management, even if you want, don't want to, <laughs> just, just managing issues or things like that. You, yeah. you will learn HR because you're dealing with people. Uh, so I think it's, I mean, uh, out of pain, there's also a lot of rewards, and it's uh, so. I think that's uh, you will. Uh, that's the thing. Like there's the soft uh, skills of open source. I think uh, been most rewarding for me. Yeah, that's great. I think I totally agree. Someone once told me a long time ago, like I, I can teach you out of a book to do anything technically, but mm-hmm. I can't teach you how to be kind to people, how to have conversation with people, and generally just be enjoy a joy to work with and that's what i've tried very very hard in my life to figure out right um because if people don't want to work with me i'll be out of a job very very quickly and i'll never be able to get a job for a long time in the future so if i can be better at being a better person and being a better teammate it just helps my career also being a better person being a, a better husband and a better father makes me a more enjoyable person outside of work. Yeah, and that's why like with work, I think exits are more important than how you enter. Like yes. if you leave, so you're welcome back, then you have actually succeeded like uh, in a good yeah, way, I think. Yeah, that's very true. So it's so like if I leave the, like this chat and you want to invite me back someday, <laughs> then I... Uh, then I, I mean, that. you know, I, I, like, I, like I said to you when before we got started, like these conversations, they're an hour and yeah. you'll be surprised when the hour's over because... Typically, when you have conversations with people that you enjoy having chats with about interesting topics, it goes by quickly. And, you know, I just want to thank you for your time. I know it's late there in Sweden. So uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. And do you have any parting words to say before we sign off? No, I just want to thank you. And like anyone, feel free to reach out. Uh, yep. and, and thank you for your time. Yeah. Excellent. So if you're not following Matthias already, it's dev lead on Twitter, dev lead on GitHub to take a look at some of the stuff that he's doing in the open source space. And that's it for us today. So enjoy the rest of your day, everybody, and take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.